This presentation of the Law of Success in 16 Lessons by Napoleon Hill is brought to you by AudioEnlightenment.com. Copyright 2011. All rights reserved. The Law of Success, Lesson 10, Pleasing Personality. You can do it if you believe you can. What is an attractive personality? Of course, the answer is a personality that attracts. But what causes a personality to attract? Let us proceed to find out. Your personality is the sum total of your characteristics and appearances which distinguish you from all others. The clothes you wear, the lines in your face, the tone of your voice, the thoughts you think, the character you have developed by those thoughts, all constitute parts of your personality. Whether your personality is attractive or not is another matter. By far the most important part of your personality is that which is represented by your character and is therefore the part that is not visible. The style of your clothes and their appropriateness undoubtedly constitutes a very important part of your personality, for it is true that people form first impressions of you from your outward appearance. Even the manner in which you shake hands forms an important part of your personality and goes a very long way toward attracting or repelling those with whom you shake hands. This art can be cultivated. The expression of your eyes also forms an important part of your personality, for there are people, and they are more numerous than one might imagine, who can look through your eyes into your heart and see that which is written there by the nature of your most secret thoughts. The vitality of your body, sometimes called personal magnetism, also constitutes an important part of your personality. Now let us proceed to arrange these outward mediums through which the nature of our personality is expressed so that it will attract and not repel. There is one way in which you can so express the composite of your personality that it will always attract, even though you may be as homely as the circus fat woman, and this is by taking a keen-hearted interest in the other fellow's game in life. Let me illustrate exactly what is meant by relating an incident that happened some years ago, from which I was taught a lesson in master salesmanship. One day an old lady called at my office and sent in her card with a message saying that she must see me personally. No amount of coaxing by secretaries could induce her to disclose the nature of her visit. Therefore I made up my mind that she was some poor old soul who wanted to sell me a book, and remembering that my own mother was a woman, I decided to go out of the reception room and buy her book, whatever it may be. Please follow every detail thoughtfully for you too may learn a lesson in master salesmanship from this incident. As I walked down the hallway from my private office, this old lady, who was standing just outside of the railing that led to the main reception room, began to smile. I had seen many people smile, but never before had I seen one who smiled so sweetly as did this lady. It was one of those contagious smiles, because I caught the spirit of it and began to smile also. As I reached the railing, the old lady extended her hand to shake hands with me. Now, as a rule, I do not become too friendly on first acquaintances when a person calls at my office, for the reason that it is very hard to say no if the caller should ask me to do that which I do not wish to do. However, this dear old lady looked so sweetly innocent and harmless that I extended my hand and she began to shake it, whereupon I discovered that she not only had an attractive smile, but she also had a magnetic handshake. She took hold of my hand firmly, but not too firmly, and the very manner in which she went about it telegraphed the thought to my brain that it was she who was doing the honors. She made me feel that she was really and truly glad to shake my hand, and I believe that she was. I believe that her handshake came from the heart as well as from the hand. I have shaken hands with many thousands of people during my public career, but I did not recall having ever done so with anyone who understood the art of doing it as well as this old lady did. The moment she touched my hand, I could feel myself slipping, and I knew that whatever it was that she had come after, she would go away with it, and that I would aid and abet her all I could towards this end. In other words, the penetrating smile and that warm handshake had disarmed me and made me a willing victim. At a single stroke, this old lady had shorn me of all the false shell in which I could crawl when salesmen come around selling, or trying to sell, that which I do not want. 
to go back to an expression which you found quite frequently in previous lessons of this course. This gentle visitor had neutralized my mind and made me want to listen. Ah, but here is the stumbling point at which most salespeople fall and break their necks, figuratively speaking. For it is as useless to try to sell a man something until you have first made him want to listen, as it would be to command the earth to stop rotating. Note well how this old lady used a smile and a handshake as the tools with which to pry open the window that led to my heart. But the most important part of the transaction is yet to be related. Slowly and deliberately, as if she had all the time there was in the universe, which she did have as far as I was concerned at that moment, the old lady began to crystallize the first step of her victory into reality by saying, I just came here to tell you, what seemed to me to be a long pause, that I think you are doing the most wonderful work of any man in the world today. Every word was emphasized by a gentle, though firm, squeeze of my hand, and as she was looking through my eyes and into my heart as she spoke. After I regained consciousness, for it became a standing joke among my assistants at the office that I fainted dead away, I reached down and unlocked the little secret latch that fastened the gate and said, Come right in, dear lady. Come right in to my private office. And with a gallant bow that would have done credit to the cavaliers of olden times, I bade her come in and sit a while. As she entered my private office, I motioned her to a big easy chair back of my desk while I took the little hard seated chair, which under Norman circumstances I would have used as a means of discouraging her from taking up too much of my time. For three quarters of an hour, I listened to one of the most brilliant and charming conversations I have ever heard, and my visitor was doing all of the conversing. From the very start, she'd assumed the initiative and taken the lead, and up to the end of the first three quarters of an hour, she found no inclination on my part to challenge her right to it. I repeat, lest you did not get the full importance of this, that I was a willing listener. Now comes the part of the story which would make me blush with embarrassment if it were not for the fact that you and I are separated by the pages of this book. But I must summon the courage with which to tell you the facts because the entire incident would lose its significance if I failed to do so. As I have stated, my visitor entranced me with brilliant and captivating conversation for three quarters of an hour. Now what do you suppose she was talking about all that time? No, you are wrong. She was not trying to sell me a book, nor did she once use the personal pronoun I. However, she was not only trying, but actually selling me something, and that something was myself. She had no sooner been seated in that big cushioned chair than she unrolled a package which I had mistaken for a book that she had come to sell me. And sure enough, there was a book in the package, in fact several of them, for she had a complete year's file of the magazine of which I was then editor, Hill's Golden Rule. She turned the pages of those magazines and read places that she had marked here and there, assuring me, in the meanwhile, that she had always believed the philosophy back of that which she was reading. Then, after I was in a state of complete mesmerism and thoroughly receptive, my visitor tactfully switched the conversation to a subject which I suspect she had in mind to discuss with me long before she presented herself at my office. But, and this is another point at which most salespeople blunder, had she reversed the order of her conversation and begun where she finished, the chances are that she never would have had the opportunity to sit in the big easy chair. During the last three minutes of her visit, she skillfully laid before me the merits of some securities that she was selling. She did not ask me to purchase, but the way in which she told me of the merits of the securities, plus the way in which she had so impressively told me of the merits of my own game, had the psychological effect of causing me to want to purchase. And even though I made no purchase of securities from her, she made a sale. Because I picked up the telephone and introduced her to a man to whom she later sold more than five times the amount that she had intended selling me. If that same woman or another woman or a man who had the tact and personality that she possessed should call on me, I would again sit down and listen for three quarters of an hour. We are all human and we are all more or less vain. We are all alike in this respect. 
We will listen with intense interest to those who have the tact to talk to us about that which lies closest to our hearts. And then, out of the sense of reciprocity, we will also listen with interest when the speaker finally switches the conversation to the subject which lies closest to his or her heart. And at the end, we will not only sign on the dotted line, but we will say, what a wonderful personality. In the city of Chicago some years ago, I was conducting a school of salesmanship for Securities Health, which employed more than 1,500 salespeople. To keep the ranks of that big organization filled, we had to train and employ 600 new salespeople every week. Of all the thousands of men and women who went through the school, there was but one man who grasped the significance of the principle I am here describing, the first time he heard it analyzed. This man had never tried to sell securities and frankly admitted when he entered the salesmanship class that he was not a salesman. Let's see whether he was or not. After he had finished the training, one of the star salesmen took a notion to play a practical joke on him, believing him to be a credulous person who would believe all that he heard. So this star gave him an inside tip as to where he would be able to sell some securities without any great effort. This star would make the sale himself, so he said, but the man to whom he referred as being a likely purchaser was an ordinary artist who would purchase with so little urging that he, being a star, did not wish to waste his time on him. The newly made salesman was delighted to receive the tip, and forthwith he was on his way to make the sale. As soon as he was out of the office, the star gathered the other stars around him and told of the joke he was playing. For in reality, the artist was a very wealthy man, and the star himself had spent nearly a month trying to sell him, but without success. It then developed that all of the other stars of that particular group had called on this same artist, but it failed to interest him. The newly made salesman was gone about an hour and a half. When he returned, he found the stars waiting for him with smiles on their faces. To their surprise, the newly made salesman also wore a broad smile on his face. The stars looked at each other inquiringly, for they had expected that this green man would not return in a joyful mood. Well, did you sell to your man, inquired the originator of this joke? Certainly, replied the uninitiated one, and I found that artist to be all you said he was, a perfect gentleman and a very interesting man. Reaching into his pocket, he pulled out an order and a check for $2,000. The stars wanted to know how he did it. Oh, it wasn't difficult, replied the newly made salesman. I just walked in and talked to him a few minutes, and he brought up the subject of the securities himself, and said he wanted to purchase, therefore I really did not sell to him. He purchased of his own accord. When I heard of the transaction, I called the newly made salesman in and asked him to describe in detail just how he made the sale, and I will relate it just as he told it. When he reached the artist's studio, he found him at work on a picture, so engaged in his work was the artist that he did not see the salesman enter. So the salesman walked over to where he could see the picture and stood there looking at it without saying a word. Finally the artist saw him, then the salesman apologized for the intrusion and began to talk about the picture that the artist was painting. He knew just enough about art to be able to discuss the merits of the picture with some intelligence, and he was really interested in the subject. He liked the picture and frankly told the artist so, which of course made the artist very angry. For nearly an hour, these two men talked of nothing but art, particularly that picture that stood on the artist's easel. Finally, the artist asked the salesman his name and his business, and the salesman, yes, the master salesman, replied, Oh, never mind my business or my name. I am more interested in you and your art. The artist's face beamed with a smile of joy. Those words fell as sweet music upon his ears. But not to be outdone by his polite visitor, he insisted on knowing what mission had brought him to his studio. Then, with an air of genuine reluctance, this master salesman, this real star, introduced himself and told his business. Briefly, he described the securities he was selling, and the artist listened as he enjoyed every word that was spoken. After the salesman had finished, the artist said, "'Well, well, I have been very foolish.' Other salesmen from your firm have been here trying to sell me some of those securities, but they talked nothing but business. In fact, they annoyed me so that I had to ask one of them to leave. Now let me see, what was that fellow's name? 
Oh, yes, it was Mr. Perkins. Perkins was the star who had thought of this clever trick to play on the newly made salesman. But you present the matter so differently, and now I see how foolish I have been, and I want you to let me have $2,000 worth of these securities. Think of that. You present the matter so differently. And how did this newly made salesman present the matter so differently? Putting the question another way, what did this master salesman really sell the artist? Did he sell him securities? No, he sold him his own picture, which he was painting on his own canvas. The securities were but an incident. Don't overlook this point. That master salesman had remembered the story of the old lady who entertained me for three quarters of an hour by talking about that which was nearest my heart, and it had so impressed me that he made up his mind to study his prospective purchaser and find out what would interest them most, so he could talk about that. This green, newly made salesman earned $7,900 in commission the first month he was in the field, leading the next highest man by more than double. And the tragedy of it was that not one person out of the entire organization of 1,500 salespeople took the time to find out how and why he became the real star of the organization, a fact which I believe fully justifies the rather biting reprimand suggested in Lesson 9, to which you may have taken offense. A Carnegie or a Rockefeller or a James J. Hill or a Marshall Field accumulates a fortune through the application of the self-same principles that are available to all the remainder of us. But we envy them their wealth without ever thinking of studying their philosophy and appropriating it for our own use. We look at a successful man in the hour of his triumph and wonder how he did it. But we overlook the importance of analyzing his methods and we forget the price he had to pay in careful, well-organized preparation, which had to be made before he could reap the fruits of his effort. Throughout this course on the law of success, you will not find a single new principle. Every one of them is as old as civilization itself. Yet you will find but few people who seem to understand how to apply them. The salesman who sold the securities to that artist was not only a master salesman, but he was a man with an attractive personality. He was not much to look at. Perhaps that is why the star conceived the idea of playing that cruel joke on him. But even a homely person may have a very attractive personality in the eyes of those whose handiwork he has praised. Of course, there are some who will get the wrong conception of the principle I am here trying to clear. By drawing the conclusion that any sort of cheap flattery will take the place of genuine heart interest. I hope you are not one of those. I hope that you are one of those who understand the real psychology upon which this lesson is based, and that you will make it your business to study other people closely enough to find something about them or their work that you really admire. Only in this way can you develop a personality that will be irresistibly attractive. Cheap flattery has just the opposite effect to that of constituting an attractive personality. It repels instead of attracts. It is so shallow that even the ignorant easily detect it. Perhaps you have observed, and if you have not, I wish you to do so, that this lesson emphasizes at length the importance of making it your business to take a keen interest in other people and in their work, business, or profession. This emphasis why by no means an accident. You will quickly observe that the principles upon which this lesson is based are very closely related to those which constitute the foundation of Lesson 6 on imagination. Also, you will observe that this lesson is based upon much of the same general principles as those which form the most important part of Lesson 3 on cooperation. Let us here introduce some very practical suggestions as to how the laws of imagination, cooperation, and pleasing personality may be blended or coordinated to profitable ends through the creation of usable ideas. Every thinker knows that ideas are the beginning of all successful achievements. The question most often asked is, how can I learn to create ideas that will earn money? In part, we will answer this question in this lesson by suggesting some new and novel ideas any of which might be developed and made very profitable by almost anyone in practically any locality. Idea number one. 
The World War has deprived Germany of her enormous trade in toys. Before the war, we bought most of our toys from Germany. We are not likely to buy any more toys from German manufacturers in our time or for a long time afterward. Toys are in demand, not only in the United States but in foreign countries, many of which will not buy toys from Germany. Our only competitor is Japan, and her toys are of so poor a quality that her competition means nothing. But what sort of toys shall I manufacture and where will I get the capital with which to carry on the business, you will ask? First, go to a local toy dealer and find out just which class of toy sells most rapidly. If you do not feel competent to make improvements of some of the toys now on the market, advertise for an inventor with an idea for a marketable toy, and you will soon find the mechanical genius who will supply this missing link in your undertaking. Have him make you a working model of just what you want, then go to some small manufacturer, woodworker, machine shop, and the like, and arrange to have your toys manufactured. You now know just what your toy will cost, so you are ready to go to some big jobber, wholesaler, or distributor and arrange for the sale of your entire product. If you are an able salesman, you can finance this whole project on a few dollars required with which to advertise for the inventor. When you find this man, you can probably arrange with him to work out a model for you during his evening spare hours with a promise that you will give him a better job when you are manufacturing your own toys. He will probably give you all the time you want in which to pay him for his labor, or he may do the work in return for an interest in the business. You can get the manufacturer of your toys to wait for his money until you are paid by the firm to which you sell them, and if necessary, you can assign to him the invoices for the toys sold and let the money come direct to him. Of course, if you have an unusually pleasing and convincing personality and considerable ability to organize, you will be able to take the working model of your toy to some man of means and in return for an interest in your business, secure the capital with which to do your own manufacturing. If you want to know what will sell, watch a crowd of children at play. Study their likes and dislikes. Find out what will amuse them and you will probably get an idea of which to build your toy. It requires no genius to invent. Common sense is all that is necessary. Simply find out what the people want and then produce it. Produce it well, better than anyone else is doing. Give it a touch of individuality. Make it distinctive. We spend millions of dollars annually for toys with which to entertain our children. Make your new toy useful as well as interesting. Make it educational if possible. If it entertains and teaches at the same time, it will sell readily and live forever. If your toy is in the nature of a game, make it teach the child something about the world in which it lives. Geography, arithmetic, English, physiology, etc. Or better still, produce a toy that will cause the child to run, jump, or in some other way exercise. Children love to move about, and moving about is of benefit to them, especially when stimulated by the play motive. An indoor baseball game would be a ready seller, especially in the cities. Work out an arrangement for attaching a ball to a string that will be suspended from the ceiling so one child may throw the ball against the wall and then stand back and strike it with a bat as it rebounds. A one-child baseball game, in other words. Plan number two. This will be of interest only to the man or woman who has the self-confidence and the ambition to run the risk of making a big income, which we may add most people have not. It is a suggestion that could be put into practical operation by at least 40 or 50 people in every large city throughout the United States, and by a smaller number in smaller cities. It is intended for the man or woman who can write or will learn to write advertising copy, sales literature, follow-up letters, collection letters, and the like, using the ability to write, which we all suppose that you possess. To make practical and profitable use of this suggestion, you will need the cooperation of a good advertising agency and from one to five firms or individuals who do enough advertising to warrant their appropriation going through an agency. You should go to the agency first and make arrangement with it to employ you and pay you 7% of the gross expenditures of all accounts which you bring to it. This 7% to compensate you for getting the account and for writing the copy and otherwise serving the client in the management of his advertising appropriation. Any reliable agency will gladly give you this amount for all the business you can bring. Then you go to a firm or individual whose advertising account you wish to handle 
and say in effect that you wish to go to work without compensation. Tell what you can do and what you intend to do for that particular firm that will help it sell more goods. If the firm employs an advertising manager, you are to become virtually his assistant without pay, on one condition. Namely, that the advertising appropriation is to be placed through the agency with which you have the connection. Through this arrangement, the firm or individual whose account you thus secure will get the benefit of your personal services without cost and pay no more for placing its advertising through your agency than it would through any other. If your canvas is convincing and you really take the time to prepare your case, you will get your account without much argument. You can repeat this transaction until you have as many counts as you can handle advantageously, which under ordinary conditions will be not more than 10 or 12, probably less if one or more of your clients spends upwards of $25,000 a year in advertising. If you are a competent writer of advertising copy and have the ability to create new and profitable ideas for your clients, you will be able to hold their business from year to year. You, of course, understand that you are not to accept more accounts than you can handle individually. You should spend a portion of your time in the place of business of each of your clients. In fact, you should have a desk and a working equipment right on the grounds so you can get first-hand information as to your client's sales problem as well as accurate information as to their goods and wares. Through this sort of effort, you will give the advertising agency a reputation for effective service, such as it would get in no other way. And you will please your clients because they will see satisfactory returns from your efforts. As long as you keep the agency and the clients whom you serve satisfied, your job is safe and you will make money. A reasonable expectation of returns under this plan would be a gross business of $250,000 a year, on which your 7% would amount to $17,500. A man or woman of unusual ability could run the figure much higher than this, up to, say, an income of $25,000 a year, while the tendency would be, however, to drop down to around $5,000 to $7,500, which are the figures that the average man or woman might reasonably expect to earn. You can see that the plan has possibilities. It supplies independent work and gives you 100% of your earning power. It is better than a position as advertising manager, even if the position paid the same money, because it practically places you in a business of your own, one in which your name is constantly developing a survival value. Plan number three. This plan can be put into operation by almost any man or woman of average intelligence and with but little preparation. Go to any first-class printer and make arrangements with him to handle all the business you bring to him, allowing you a commission of, say, 10% on the gross amount. Then go to the largest user of printed matter and get samples of everything in the way of printing that they use. Form a partnership or working arrangement with a commercial artist who will go over all his printed matter, and wherever suitable or appropriate, he will improve the illustrations or make illustrations where none were used before, making a rough pencil sketch which can be pasted to the original printed matter. Then, if you are not a writer of copy, form a working arrangement with someone who is, and get him or her to go over the copy of the printed matter and improve it in every respect possible. When the work is complete, go back to the firm for who you got the printed matter, taking with you quotations on the work and show what can be done in the way of improvement. Say nothing about your quotations, however, until you have shown how much you could improve the printed matter. You will probably get the entire business of that firm by giving that sort of service in connection with every job of printing that has to be done. If you perform your service properly, you will soon have all the business that your commercial artist, your copywriter, and you can handle. It ought to be good for $5,000 a year apiece for you. Any profits that you earn from the work of others in connection with any of these plans will be a legitimate profit, a profit to which you will be entitled in return for your ability to organize and bring together the necessary talent and ability with which to perform satisfactory service. If you go into the toy business, you will be entitled to a profit on the work of those who make the toys, because it will be through your ability that employment for them is available. It is more than likely that your brains and your ability, when added to that of those who work with you or for you, will greatly increase their earning capacity. 
even to the extent that they can well afford to see you make a small amount from their efforts, because they will be still earning much more than they could earn without your guidance. You are willing to take any of these plans and make a profit out of them, are you not? You see nothing wrong on your part, do you? If you are an employee working for some other person or firm, may it not be possible that the head of that firm or individual, with his ability to organize, finance, etc., is increasing your own earnings capacity right now? You want to get out of the employee class and become an employer. We do not blame you for that. Nearly every normal person wants to do the same. The one best first step to take is to serve the firm or individual for whom you are working just as you would wish to be served if you were the individual or the head of that firm. Who are the big employers of help today? Are they the rich man's son who fell heir to employmentship? Not on your life. They are the men and women who came up from the ranks of the most lowly sort of labor. Men and women who have had no greater opportunity than you have. They are in the positions that you hold because your superior ability has enabled them intelligently to direct others. You can acquire that ability if you will try. Right in the town or city where you live, there are people who probably could benefit by knowing you, and who would undoubtedly benefit you in return. In one section of the city lives John Smith, who wishes to sell his grocery store and open a moving picture theater. In another section of the store is a man who has a moving picture theater that he would like to trade for a grocery store. Can you bring them together? If you can, you will serve both and earn a nice remuneration. In your town or city are people who want to products raised on the farm in the surrounding community. On those farms are farmers who raise farm products and who want to get them into the hands of those who live in town. If you can find a way of carrying the farm products direct from the farm to the city, or town consumer, you will enable the farmer to get more for his products and the consumer to get these products for less. And still, there will be a margin to pay you for your ingenuity in shortening the route between the producer and consumer. In business, there are, broadly speaking, two classes of people, the producers and the consumers. The tendency of the things is to find some way of bringing these two together without so many intermediaries. Find a way to shorten the route between producer and consumer, and you will have created a plan that will help these two classes and handsomely profit you. The laborer is worthy of his hire. If you can create such a plan, you are entitled to a fair proportion of that which you save for the consumer, and also a fair proportion of that which you make for the producer. Let us warn you that whatever plan you create as a means of making money, you had better see that it slices off a little of the cost to the consumer instead of adding a little to that cost. The business of bringing produce and consumer together is a profitable business when it is conducted fairly to both and without a greedy desire to get all there is in sight. The American public is wonderfully patient with profiteers who impose upon them, but there is a pivotal point beyond which even the shrewdest of them dare not go. It may be all right to corner the diamond market and run up enormous high the price of those white rocks which are dug out of the ground in Africa without trouble. But when the prices of food and clothing and other necessities begin to soar skyward, there is a chance of someone getting into the bad graces of the American public. If you crave wealth and are really brave enough to shoulder the burdens which go with it, Reverse the usual method of acquiring it by giving your goods and wares to the world at the lowest possible profit you can afford, instead of exacting all that you can with safety. Ford has found it profitable to pay his workers, not as little as he can get them for, but as much as his profits will permit. He has also found it profitable to reduce the price of his automobiles to the consumer, while other manufacturers, many of whom have long since failed, continue to increase their prices. There may be some perfectly good plans through the operation of which you could squeeze the consumer and still manage to keep out of jail, but you enjoy much more peace of mind and in all probability more profits in the long run if your plan when you complete it is built along the Ford lines. You have heard John D. Rockefeller abused considerably but most of this abuse has been prompted by sheer envy upon the part of those who would like to have his money, but who haven't the inclination to earn it. Regardless of your opinion on Rockefeller, do not forget that he began as a humble bookkeeper 
and that he gradually climbed to the top in the accumulation of money because of his ability to organize and direct other and less able men intelligently. This author can remember when he had to pay 25 cents for a gallon of lamp oil and walk two miles through the hot sun and carry it home in a tin can in the bargain. Now Rockefeller's wagon will deliver at the back door, in the city or on the farm, at a little over half that sum. Who has a right to begrudge Rockefeller his millions, as long as he has reduced the price of a needed commodity? He could just as easily have increased the price of lamp oil to half a dollar, but we seriously doubt that he would be a multimillionaire today if he had done so. There are a lot of us who want money, but 99 out of every 100 who start to create a plan through which to get money give all their thought to the scheme through which to get a hold of it, and no thought to the service to be given in return for it. A pleasing personality is one that makes use of imagination and cooperation. We have cited the foregoing illustrations on how ideas may be created to show you how to coordinate the laws of imagination, cooperation, and a pleasing personality. Analyze any man who does not have a pleasing personality, and you will find lacking in that man the faculties of imagination and cooperation also. This brings us to a suitable place at which to introduce one of the greatest lessons on personality ever placed on paper. It is also one of the most effective lessons on salesmanship ever written. For the subjects of attractive personality and a salesmanship must also go hand in hand. They are inseparable. I have reference to Shakespeare's masterpiece, Mark Antony's speech at the funeral of Caesar. Perhaps you have read this oration, but it is here presented with interpretations and parentheses which may help you to gather new meaning from it. The setting for that oration was something like the following. Caesar is dead, and Brutus, his slayer, is called on to tell the Roman mob that is gathered at the undertakers why he put Caesar out of the way. Picture in your imagination a howling mob that was none too friendly to Caesar, and that already believed that Brutus had done a noble deed by murdering him. Brutus takes the platform and makes a short statement of his reasons for killing Caesar. Confident that he has won the day, he takes his seat. His whole demeanor is that of one who believes his word will be accepted without question. It is one of haughtiness. Mark Antony now takes the platform, knowing that the mob is antagonistic to him because he is a friend of Caesar. In a low, humble tone of voice, Antony begins to speak. Antony, for Brutus' sake, I am beholding to you. Fourth citizen, what does he say of Brutus? Third citizen, he says, for Brutus' sake, he finds himself beholding to us all. Fourth citizen, Twere best he speaks no harm of Brutus here. First citizen, this Caesar was a tyrant. Third citizen, nay, that's certain. We are blessed that Rome is rid of him. Second citizen, peace, let us hear what Antony can say. Here you will observe in Antony's opening statements his clever method of neutralizing the minds of his listeners. Antony, you gentle Romans... Parentheses, about as gentle as a gang of Bolsheviks in a revolutionary labor meeting. All. Peace ho, let us hear him. Had Anthony begun his speech by knocking Brutus, the history of Rome would have been different. Antony. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. Align himself with what he knew to be the state of mind of his listeners. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft inferred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault. And grievously bathed Caesar answered it. Here under the leave of Brutus and the rest. For Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak at Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransom did the general coffer fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious, when the poor have cried, 
Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse was this ambition. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and surely he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reasons. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. At this point, Antony paused to give his audience a chance to discuss hurriedly among themselves his opening statements. His object in doing this was to observe what effect his words were having, just as a master salesman always encourages his prospective purchasers to talk so he may know what is in his mind. First citizen, methinks there is much in his saying. Second citizen, if thou consider rightly of the matter, Caesar has had great wrong. Third citizen, has he masters? I fear there will be worse to come in his place. Fourth citizen, marked ye his words, he would not take the crown, therefore tis certain he was not ambitious. First citizen, if it be found so, someone will dear abide it. Second citizen, poor soul, his eyes are red as fire with weeping. Third citizen, there's not a nobler man in Rome than Antony. Fourth citizen, now mark him, he begins again to speak. Antony, but yesterday the word of Caesar might have stood against the world, now lies he there, and none so poor to do him reverence. O masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honorable men. Observe how often Antony has repeated the term honorable, Observe also how cleverly he brings in the first suggestion that perhaps Brutus and Cassius may not be as honorable as the Roman mob believes them to be. This suggestion is carried in the words mutiny and rage, which he here uses for the first time, after his pause gave him time to observe that the mob was swinging over toward his side of the argument. Observe how carefully he is feeling his way and making his words fit that which he knows to be the frame of mind of the listeners. Antony, I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honorable men. Crystallization, his suggestion into hatred of Brutus and Cassius, he then appeals to their curiosity and begins to lay the foundation for his climax, a climax which he knows will win the mob because he is reaching it so cleverly that the mob believes it to be its own conclusion. Antony, but here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet, tis his will. Let but the commons hear his testaments, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read. Tightening up on his appeal to their curiosity by making them believe he does not intend to read the will. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds, and dip their napkins in his sacred blood. Yea, beg a hair of him for memory, and dine mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. Human nature always wants that which is difficult to get, or that of which is about to be deprived. Observe how craftily Antony has awakened the interest of the mob, and made them want to hear the reading of the will, thereby preparing them to hear it with open minds. This marks his second step in the process of neutralizing their minds. All. The will, the will, we will hear Caesar's will. Antony. Have patience, gentle friends. I must not read it. It has not made you know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood, you are not stones, but men. And being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you. It will make you mad. Tis good you know not that you are as hares. For if you should, oh, what will come of it? Fourth citizen, read the will. We will hear it. Antony, 
You shall read us the will, Caesar's will. Will you be patient? Will you stay a while? I have or hurt myself to tell you of it. I fear I wrong the honorable men. Whose daggers have stabbed Caesar's, I do fear it. Daggers and stabbed it suggests cruel murder. Observe how cleverly Antony injects this suggestion into his speech, and observe also how quickly the mob catches its significance, because unknown to the mob, Antony has carefully prepared their minds to receive this suggestion. Fourth citizen. They were traitors, honorable men. All. The will, the testament. Second citizen. They were villains, murderers, the will. Just what Antony would have said in the beginning but he knew it would have had a more desirable effect if he planted the thought in all the minds of the mob and permitted them to say it in themselves. Antony, you will compel me then to read the will? Then make a ring about the corpse of Caesar, and let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend, and will you give me leave? This was a point at which Brutus should have begun to look for a back door through which to make his escape. All. Come down, second citizen, descend, third citizen, room for Antony, most noble Antony. Antony, nay, press not so much upon me, stand far off. He knew this command would make them want to draw near, which is what he wanted them to do. All, stand back, room. Antony, if you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle, I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. T'was on a summer evening in this tent, that day he overcame the Nervi. Look in this place, ran Cassius dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this the well-beloved Brutus stabbed, and as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it. As rushing out the door to be resolved, if Brutus so unkindly knocked or no, for Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, O oh you gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindest cut of all. For when the noble Caesar saw him stab, in gratitude more strong than traitor's arms, quiet vanquished him, then burst his mighty heart, and in his mantle muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statue, which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen! Then I and you and all of us fell down, while bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now you weep, and I perceive you fail the dint of pity, these of gracious drops. Kind soul, why weep you when you but behold our Caesar's vesture wounded? Look you here. Here is himself, marred as you see with traitors, Observe how Antony now uses the words traitors quite freely, because he knows that it is in harmony with that which is the minds of the Roman mob. First citizen, O piteous spectacle, O woeful day, O woeful day, O most bloody sight, we will be revenged. Had Brutus been a wise man instead of a braggart, he would have been many miles from the scene at this time. All. Revenge, about, seek, burn, kill, fire, slay, let not a traitor live. Here Antony takes the next step towards crystallizing the frenzy of the mob into action, but clever salesman that he is does not try to force this action. Antony, stay, countryman, first citizen, peace there, hear the noble Antony. Second citizen, we will hear him. We will follow him. We'll die with him. From these words, Antony knows that he has the mob with him. Observe how he takes advantage of this psychological moment, the moment from which all master salesmen wait. Antony, good friends, sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. They that have done this deed are honorable. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not. They made them do it, they were wise and honorable, and will no doubt with reasons answer you. I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I am no orator, as Brutus is. But as you know me all, a plain, blunt man, 
that love my friend, and that they know full well, that gave me public leave to speak of him. For I have neither wit, nor words, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the power of speech, to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. I tell you that which you selves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor, dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus, and Brutus Antony, there are Antony, would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar's that should move the stones of Rome to rise in mutiny. All will mutiny, first citizen, will burn the houses of Brutus, third citizens, away then, come seek the conspirators. Antony, yet hear me, countrymen, yet hear me speak. All peace, ho, hear Antony, most noble Antony. Antony, why, friends, you go to do you know not what? Wherein hath Caesar thus deserved your love? Alas, you know not, I must tell you then. You have forgot the will I told you of. Antony is now ready to play his trump card. He is ready to reach his climax. Observe how well he has marshaled his suggestions, step by step, saving until his last important statement, the one on which he relied for action. In the great field of salesmanship and in public speaking, many a man tries to reach this point too soon, tries to rush his audience or his prospective purchaser, and thereby loses his appeal. All. Most true, the will. Let's stay and hear the will. Antony. Here is the will, and under Caesar's seal. To every Roman citizen he gives. To several men, seventy-five drachmas. Second citizen. Most noble Caesar will revenge his death. Third citizen, O royal Caesar. Antony, hear me with patience. All, peace, ho. Antony, moreover he have left you all his walks, his private arbors and new planted orchards. On this side Tiber he hath left them you, and to your hairs forever common pleasures, to walk abroad and recreate yourself. Here was a Caesar, when comes such another. First citizen, never, never, come, away, away, will burn his body in the holy place, and with the brands fire the traitor's houses, take up the body. Second citizen, go fetch fire. Third citizen, pluck down benches. Fourth citizen, pluck down forms, windows, anything. And that was Brutus' finish. He lost his case because he lacked the personality and the good judgment with which to present his argument from the viewpoint of the Roman mob, as Mark Antony did. His whole attitude clearly indicated that he thought pretty well of himself, that he was proud of his deed. We have all seen people in this day and time who somewhat resemble Brutus in this respect. But if we observe closely, we notice that they did not accomplish very much. Suppose that Mark Antony had mounted the platform in a strutting attitude and had begun his speech in this wise. Now let me tell you Romans something about this man Brutus. He is a murderer at heart and he would have gone no further for the mob would have howled him down. Clever salesman and practical psychologist that he was, Mark Antony so presented his case that it appeared not to be his own idea at all but that of the Roman mob itself. Go back to the lesson on initiative and leadership and read it again. And as you read, compare the psychology of it with that of Mark Antony's speech. Observe how the you and not I attitude towards others was emphasized. Observe, if you please, how this same point is emphasized throughout the course, and especially in Lesson 7 on Enthusiasm. Shakespeare was by far the most able psychologist and writer known to civilization. For that reason, all of his writings are based upon unerring knowledge of the human mind. Throughout this speech, which he placed in the mouth of Mark Antony, you will observe how carefully he assumed the you attitude, so carefully that the Roman mob was sure that its decision was on its own making. I must call your attention, however, to the fact that Mark Antony's appeal to the self-interest of the Roman mob was of the crafty type, 
and was based upon the stealth with which dishonest men often make use of this principle in appealing to the cupidity and avarice of their victims. While Mark Antony displayed evidence of great self-control in being able to assume at the beginning of his speech an attitude toward Brutus that was not real, at the same time it is obvious that his entire appeal was based upon his knowledge of how to influence the minds of the Roman mob through flattery. The two letters reproduced in Lesson 7 of this course illustrate in a very concrete way the value of the you and the fatality of the I appeal. Go back and read these letters again and observe how the more successful of the two follows closely to Mark Antony's appeal, while the other one is based upon an appeal of just the opposing nature. Whether you are writing a sales letter or preaching a sermon or writing an advertisement or a book, you will do well to follow the same principles employed by Mark Antony in his famous speech. Now let us turn our attention to the study of ways and means through which one may develop a pleasing personality. Let us start with the first essential, which is character, for no one may have a pleasing personality without the foundation of a sound, positive character. Through the principle of telepathy, you telegraph the nature of your character to those with whom you come in contact, which is responsible for what you have often called an intuitive feeling that the person whom you have just met, but about whom you did not know very much, was not trustworthy. You may embellish yourself with clothes of the neatest and latest design, and conduct yourself in the most pleasing manner as far as outside appearances go. But if there is greed and envy and hatred and jealousy and avarice and selfishness in your heart, you will never attract any, except those characters which harmonize with your own. Like attracts like, and you may be sure, therefore, that those who are attracted to you are those whose inward natures parallel your own. You may embellish yourself with an artificial smile that belies your feelings, and you may practice the art of handshaking so that you can imitate perfectly the handshake of the person who is an adept at this art. But if these outward manifestations of an attractive personality lack that vital factor called earnestness of purpose, they will repel instead of attract. How, then, may one build character? The first step in character building is rigid self-discipline. In both the second and eighth lesson of this course, you will find the formula through which you may shape your character after any pattern that you choose. But I repeat it here, as it is based upon a principle that will bear much repetition as follows. First, select those whose characters were made up of the qualities which you wish to build into your own character and then proceed in the manner described in Lesson 2 to appropriate these qualities through the aid of auto-suggestion. Create in your imagination a council table and gather your characters around it each night, first having written out a clear, concise statement of the particular qualities that you wish to appropriate from each. Then proceed to affirm or suggest to yourself, in outspoken, audible words, that you are developing the desired qualities in yourself, as you do this, close your eyes and see in your imagination the figures seated around your imaginary table in the manner described in Lesson 2. Second, through the principles described in Lesson 8 on self-control, control your thoughts and keep your mind vitalized with thoughts of a positive nature. Let the dominating thought of your mind be a picture of that person that you intend to be, the person that you are deliberately building through this procedure. At least a dozen times a day when you have a few minutes to yourself, shut your eyes and direct your thoughts to the figures which you have selected to sit on your imaginary council table and feel with a faith that knows no limitation that you are actually growing to resemble in character those figures of your choice. Third, find at least one person each day and more if possible in whom you see good quality that is worthy of praise and praise it Remember, however, that this praise must not be in the nature of cheap, insincere flattery. It must be genuine. Speak your words of praise with which such earnestness that they will impress those to whom you speak. Then watch what happens. You will have rendered those whom you praise a decided benefit of great value to them. And you will have gone just one more step in the direction of developing the habit 
of looking for and finding the good qualities in others. I cannot emphasize the far-reaching effects of this habit of praising, openly and enthusiastically, the good qualities in others. For this habit will soon reward you with a feeling of self-respect and manifestation of gratitude from others that will modify your entire personality. Here again the law of attraction enters and those whom you praise will see in you the qualities that you see in them. Your success in the application of this formula will be in exact proportion to your faith in its soundness. I do not merely believe that it is sound, I know that it is. And the reason I know is that I have used it successfully, and I have also taught others how to use it successfully. Therefore, I have a right to promise you that you can use it with equal success. Furthermore, you can, with the aid of this formula, develop an attractive personality so speedily that you will surprise all who know you. The development of such a personality is entirely within your control a fact which gives you a tremendous advantage and at the same time places upon you the responsibility if you fail or neglect to exercise your privilege. I now wish to direct your attention to the reason for speaking aloud the affirmation that you are developing the desired qualities which you have selected as the materials out of which to develop an attractive personality. This procedure has two desirable effects, namely, first, it sets into motion the vibration through which the thought back of your word reaches and embeds itself into your subconscious mind, where it takes root and grows until it becomes a great moving force in your outward physical activities, leading in the direction of transformation of the thought into reality. Second, it develops in you the ability to speak with force and conviction, which will lead finally to great ability as a public speaker. No matter what your calling in life may be, you should be able to stand upon your feet and speak convincingly, as this is one of the most effective ways of developing an attractive personality. Put feeling and emotion into your words as you speak, and develop a deep, rich tone of voice. If your voice is inclined to be high-pitched, tone it down until it is soft and pleasing. You can never express an attractive personality to the best advantage, through a harsh or shrill voice. You must cultivate your voice until it becomes rhythmical and pleasing to the ear. Remember that speech is the chief method of expressing your personality, and for this reason it is to your advantage to cultivate a style that is both forceful and pleasing. I do not recall a single outstanding attractive personality that was not made up in part of ability to speak with force and conviction. Study the prominent men and women of today, wherever you find them, and observe the significant fact that the more prominent they are, the more effective and efficient are they in speaking forcefully. Study the outstanding figures of the past in politics and statesmanship, and observe that the most successful ones were those who were noted for their ability to speak with force and conviction. In the field of business, industry, and finance, it seems significant also that the most prominent leaders are men and women who are able to publicly speak. In fact, no one may hope to become a prominent leader in any noteworthy undertaking without developing the ability to speak with forthfulness that carries conviction. While the salesman may never deliver a public address, he will profit nevertheless if he develops the ability to do so because this ability increases his power to talk convincingly in ordinary conversation. Let us now summarize the chief factors which enter into the development of an attractive personality as follows. First, form the habit of interesting yourself in other people and make it your business to find their good qualities and speak of them in terms of praise. Second, develop the ability to speak with force and conviction, both in your ordinary conversational tones and before public gatherings, where you must use more volume. Third, clothe yourself in a style that is becoming to your physical build and the work in which you are engaged. Fourth, develop a positive character through the aid of the formula outlined in this lesson. Fifth, learn how to shake hands so that you expect warmth of feeling and enthusiasm through this form of greeting. Sixth, attract other people to you by first attracting yourself to them. Seventh, 
Remember that your only limitation within reason is the one which you set up in your own mind. These seven points cover the most important factors that enter into the development of an attractive personality, but it seems hardly necessary to suggest that such a personality will not develop of its own accord. It will develop if you submit yourself to the discipline herein described with a firm determination to transform yourself into the person that you would like to be. As I study this list of seven important factors that enter into the development of an attractive personality, I feel moved to direct your attention to the second and the fourth as being the most important. If you will cultivate these finer thoughts and feelings and actions out of which a positive character is built and then learn to express yourself with force and conviction, you will have developed an attractive personality. For it will be seen that out of this attainment will come the other qualities here outlined. There is a great power of attraction back of the person who has a positive character, and this power expresses itself through unseen as well as visible sources. The moment you come within speaking distance of such a person, even though not a word is spoken, the influence of the unseen power within makes itself felt. Every shady transaction in which you engage, every negative thought that you think, and every destructive act in which you indulge destroys just so much of that subtle something within you that is known as character. There is full confession in the glances of our eyes, in our smiles and salutations in the grasp of the hands. His sin bedobs him, mars all his good impression. Most men know why they not trust him, but they do not trust him. His vice glasses his eyes, demeans his cheek, pinches his nose, sets the mark of beast on the back of his head, and writes, O fool, O fool, on the forehead of a king. Emerson. I would direct your attention now to the first of the seven factors that enter into the development of an attractive personality. You have observed that all through this lesson I have gone into lengthy detail to show the material advantages of being agreeable to other people. However, the biggest advantage of all lies not in the possibility of monetary or material gain which this habit offers, but in the beautifying effect that it has upon the character of all who practice it. Acquire the habit of making yourself agreeable and you profit both materially and mentally. For you will never be as happy in other things way as you will be when you know that you are making others happy. Remove the chips from your shoulders and quit challenging men to engage you in useful arguments. Remember the smoke glasses through which you see what you believe to be the blueness of life and behold the shining sunlight of friendliness in its stead. Throw away your hammer and quit knocking, for surely you must know that the big prizes of life go to the builders and not the destroyers. The man who builds a house is an artist. The man who tears it down is a junkman. If you are a person with a grievance, the world will listen to your vitrolic ravings, provided it does not see you coming. But if you are a person with a message of friendliness and optimism, it will listen because it wishes to do so. No person with a grievance can be also a person with an attractive personality. The art of being agreeable, just that one simple trait, is the very foundation of all successful salesmanship. I drive my automobile five miles into the outskirts of the city to purchase gasoline, which I could procure within two blocks of my own garage. Because the man who runs the filling station is an artist, he makes it his business to be agreeable. I go there not because he has cheaper gasoline, but because I enjoy the vitalizing effect of his attractive personality. 50th Street and Broadway in New York, not because I cannot find any other good shoes at the same price, but for the reason that Mr. Cobb, the manager of that particular Regal store, has an attractive personality. While he is fitting me with shoes, he makes it his business to talk to me on subject which he knows to be close to my heart. I do my banking at the Harriman National Bank at 44th Street and 5th Avenue, not because there are not scores of other good banks much near my place of business, but for the reason that the tellers and the cashiers and the lobby detective and Mr. Harriman and all of the others with whom I come into contact 
make it their business to be agreeable. My account is small, but they receive me as though it were large. I greatly admire John D. Rockefeller, Jr., not because he is the son of one of the world's richest men, but for the better reason that he, too, has acquired the art of being agreeable. In the little city of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, lives M.T. Garvin, a very successful merchant whom I would travel hundreds of miles to visit, not because he is a wealthy merchant, but for the reason that he makes it his business to be agreeable. However, I have no doubt that his material success is closely related to this noble art of affability which he has acquired. I have in my vest pocket a Parker fountain pen, and my wife and children have pens of the same brand, not because they are not other good fountain pens, but for the reason that I have attracted to George S. Parker on account of his habit of being agreeable. My wife takes the ladies home journal, not because there are not other good magazines of similar nature, but for the reason that we became attracted to the journal several years ago, while Edward Bach was its editor, because he had acquired the art of being agreeable. O oh, ye struggling pilgrims who are searching for the rainbow's end, ye drawers of water and hewers of wood, tarry for a moment by the wayside, and learn a lesson from a successful man or woman who have succeeded because they acquired the art of being agreeable. You can win for a time through ruthlessness and stealth. You can garner in more of this world's goods than you will need by sheer force and shrewd strategy, without taking the time or going to the trouble of being agreeable. But sooner or later you will come to the point in life at which you will feel the pangs of remorse and the emptiness of your well-filled purse. I never think of power and position and wealth that was attained by force without feeling, very deeply, the sentiment expressed by a man whose name I dare not mention, as he stood at the tomb of Napoleon. A little while ago I stood by the grave of the old Napoleon, a magnificent tomb of gilt and gold, fit almost for a deity dead, and gazed upon the sarcophagus of rare and nameless marble, where rest at last the ashes of that restless man. I leaned over the balustrade and thought about the career of the greatest soldier of the modern world. I saw him at Toulon. I saw him walking upon the banks of the Seine, contemplating suicide. I saw him putting down the mob in the streets of Paris. I saw him at the head of the army in Italy. I saw him crossing the bridge at Lodi with the tricolor in his hands. I saw him in Egypt, in the shadows of the pyramids. I saw him conquer the Alps and mingle the eagles of France with the eagles of the Craig. I saw him at Marengo, at Um and at Oshelots. I saw him in Russia, when the infantry of the snow and the cavalry of the wild blast scattered his legions like winter's withered leaves. I saw him at Leipzig in defeat and disaster, driven by a million bayonets back upon Paris, clutched like a wild beast, banished to Elba. I saw him escape and retake an empire by the force of his genius. I saw him upon the frightful field of Waterloo, where chance and fate combined to wreck the fortunes of their former king. And I saw him at St. Helena, with his hands crossed behind him, gazing out upon the sad and solemn sea. I thought of the widows and orphans he had made, of the tears that had been shed for his glory, and of the only woman who ever loved him, pushed from his heart by the cold hand of ambition. And I said I would rather have been a French peasant and worn wooden shoes. I would rather have lived in a hut with a vine growing over the door and the grapes growing purple in the amorous kisses of the autumn sun. I would rather have been the poor peasant with my wife by my side knitting as the day died out of the sky, with my children upon my knees and their arms about me, I would rather have been this man and gone down to the tongueless silence of the dreamless dust than to have been the imperial personification of force and murder known as Napoleon the Great. I leave you with this as the fitting climax for this lesson, the thought of this deathless dissertation on a man who lived by the sword of force and died an ignominious death, an outcast in the eyes of his fellow men, a sore to the memory of civilization, a failure because he did not acquire the art of being agreeable, because he could not or would not subordinate self for the good of his followers. End of chapter. End of lesson.